Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Wars End History Story. This week I am covering a few stories related to Park Road in Wars End. There are often some very interesting stories connected to the various streets of Wars End and Park Road was certainly one of them and I definitely felt that it was worth covering. So the stories may be about buildings or they may be about people who once lived there. I do hope you will enjoy it and find it interesting. These stories are all from different years and they are not in any particular order and some of the stories may be slightly longer than others. I would also like to add that I am recording this a couple of weeks before you are likely to hear it and at the moment I do have a bit of a cold which I thought had gone but seems to have come back so hopefully I don't sound too sniffy though I think I probably will. The Spiritualist Church on Park Road is a well-known building to many of us in Wall's End. It's also still a very popular place. And I know that people have often asked how long has it been there, when was it first opened, etc. And I am pleased to say that I now know the answer. In 1931, a newspaper article discussed the opening of the new Spiritualist Church. It was officially opened by Mrs. J. Graham and there was no mention of a special key on this occasion, but it was said that the building was full to capacity and at the time it would hold up to 250 people. The church had cost around £700 to build, and yes, you've guessed it, that would be around £60,000 today. And the building of the church, it said, had been supervised by Mr M Heppel. Very few details were given about the design and building other than that. It was described as being 60 feet long and 30 feet wide with a main hall for worship and a smaller hall which would be used during the evenings of the week. At the time, the president of the church was Mr W Miller and the vice presidents were Mrs K and Mrs Johnson. Unfortunately, there are no photos from the time it was first built so I can't say what it looked like then or what colour it was but you can see what it looks like now from the photos on screen which I have taken recently. It may not have cost a lot to build compared to other churches in the area, but it has certainly stood the test of time and is still there today, still in use and still looking in quite good condition, though I would imagine it has had a few updates over the years. I have been in this church once or twice many years ago and I was wondering how many of you watching this have been there too or if you still go there. Do let me know in the comments below. As I have said before, some of my favourite old newspaper articles are about properties for sale. Often it's the description of them that I like to see and this next article is from 1913 and is about the sale of four flats in Park Road and they are numbers 15, 17, 19 and I forgot 13. At the time of the sale, which was to be held as an auction in the station hotel, the properties were all rented out and producing a yearly rent of around £58. The upstairs flats all contained four rooms with a scullery and a bath and the downstairs flats had three rooms with a scullery and a bath. I am not sure what these baths were like but I do remember some of the earlier bath additions to houses without them were a simple bath in the corner of a room like a scullery often with a bench that came down over the top of them for when they were not in use. Outside of the flats, they had what was described as a small plot to the front and shared backyards to the rear. And in the backyards, you could find the wash houses and, so the article said, the usual conveniences, or in other words, your outside toilets. I have to admit that I was quite surprised that they didn't have inside toilets, as the houses higher up on Park Road were built at around the same time, and they did have inside toilets. The advert went on to state that the flats had been built three years earlier and were still in good order. They also mentioned that the Wall's End and Carville railway stations are within re easy reach and that the properties are easily rented out and that they always command very good tenants. Sadly, as I have said before, there is rarely a follow-up story, so I have no idea how much they eventually sold for. 
Another building that was for sale in Park Road several years earlier in 1902 was a shop at number 84 Park Road, rented out for £28 a year to Mr George Gibbon. Sadly, the article doesn't say what kind of shop it is, so I have kind of included this in the video just in the hope that someone may know who Mr Gibbon was and what he sold. Next is what I would call a real a social history story from Park Road. In 1917, the death was announced of Mr Roger Brand. Mr Brand had trained as a chemist and he had also been a postmaster in Wall's End when, as the papers described it, Wall's End was nothing more than a little village. Mr Brand worked as both a chemist and a postmaster for many years, but when the town began to grow and a proper post office was needed, he sold his chemist shop and worked for the rest of his life as a postmaster. The first post office that I thought of in Wall's End is the one in the photo on screen at the moment on the high street, though I know there were other smaller ones in Wall's End too, such as the one opposite the Burnside School and the one near to the town hall, but these were not what I would have called a main post office. But I would imagine as well that most people watching this would be like me and more likely to be able to remember the one at the bottom of Station Road. And I do believe that the post box on the high street is still in the same place today. Mr. Brand was also someone who took a very active role in opening of the in the opening of the Masonic Hall in Wall's End, and he was the founder and past master of the Carville Lodge. On top of this, he was the treasurer of the Wall's End Walker and Willington Key Building Society, so he was certainly a man who liked to keep himself busy. He had married in 1876 and had four sons and five daughters. I wanted to include his story in this video as I felt he was someone who had clearly been important in Wall's End in the past, but he was also someone who I had never really heard anything about before, so I thought that he was certainly worth remembering for the big part he had played in Wall's End's history. Mr Brand was buried in Churchbank Cemetery, but sadly I was not able to find any details of any headstone there for him or his family. And finally, because this last story is quite long, in 1931 a lot of discussion was going on in War's End about the need for a public library. It was said that a library had been promised when the town hall was built and the baths and the fire station, but sadly there still wasn't one and all the space in the town hall had now been used for other things. However, there was now a possibility, if the price was right, to take on a building in Park Road and convert it to a public library, and this was the Kasna Kellner Memorial Institute building. Because the Kasna Kellner Alkali Company had now moved to another area, the building was available for sale. Just to add this, just to add to this, the building in Park Road had been built by Kasna Kellner Alkali Company as a memorial to Mr. H. Y. Kasna, or as he was better known to his friends, Hamilton Young Kasna. Born in New York in 1858, Hamilton was a chemist and had travelled to the UK in 1886, at first producing aluminium and later sodium peroxide. His main alkali company was formed in Runcorn in Cheshire, along with another name, man by the name of Carl Kellner. Hamilton died of tuberculosis in 1899 at the age of 41. His memorial building in Wall's End was built in 1912, as you can see by the date stone in this photo. And it did make me wonder if there were other similar buildings around the UK, as I am quite sure they wouldn't have just built one in Wall's End. Prior to its closure, the building had been used by the employees of the Alkali Company as a sort of social club, and had also been the venue for many interesting lectures, though on what subjects the article did not say. So back now to 1931, and one newspaper reported that the Library Committee, which had been formed in 1930, were hoping that the Council would make an offer for the building as they felt it was very suitable for their use. And although I wasn't able to find any article stating how much it cost, the building was secured and a library for Wall's End would finally happen. However, it wasn't a quick process, and by 1932 it still wasn't open. 
At this point in time, it was said that the Carnegie United Kingdom Trust were prepared to make a grant of £300 for books for the library, provided that a professional librarian was appointed. The Trust also stated that they were not prepared to offer any further money at the moment, but if the library was established and doing well in the next couple of years, then they may consider a further grant at a later date. The Council would also apply for a loan of £956, a very precise, to carry out alterations to the building and to provide fixtures and fittings. The job for the librarian was quickly advertised and several people in applied including John Scott of South Shields, Florence Cook of Durham, Elizabeth Parry of Essex and Helen Wadsworth of Bladen. Sadly, and I did search, I did not find out who the successful candidate was, but it must have been seen as a good and well-paid job if people from as far away as Essex were applying for the post. The library saga did rumble on for a little while longer after this, as it was not until 1933 that it was finally opened to the public. The article at the time of the opening said that experts who had viewed the new library, which had been officially opened by Sir J.B. Hunter, said it was one of the best they had ever seen. It, they said, had been carefully adapted and was perfect as a library. On the ground floor, the London Library contained around 8,000 books and there was also a reading room and a reference room. But work was still going on as the first floor was not yet completed for public use. However, it was hoped that the library itself would be a great success and popular with the people of Wall's End. And it must have been very successful as by 1965 it was seen as being too small despite expanding slightly, and the new purpose-built library on Ferndale Avenue would be built. The library on Ferndale is the one that I remember, going there for school research in the time before computers, and going to get my Nana's books out for her, and also to get my own when I was younger, and wanted to read by Enid Blyton books. As for the Park Road Library, well, I don't remember that at all. It was closed as a library long before I was able to read words bigger than a cat or dog. And my only memories of it were as a careers office when I was leaving school in the 80s, which feels like a very long time ago now. Anyway, I am sure some of you watching this video will have memories of the old Park Road Library. So do please share them in the comments below as I would love to hear them all. Just to finish off about this building, it is still very much in use today and it's great to see one of the two oldest purpose-built buildings on Park Road that aren't houses, the other being the church, are still there and still being used in 2024. I know that I haven't covered many different stories in this video, but a couple of them were quite long and I do try to keep the World's End history stories to around 10 or 12 minutes and this one is slightly longer than that as I hope that that helps people not to lose interest. So I will save the rest of my Park Road stories for another time. I do hope that you have enjoyed this video and found it interesting and I hope that my sniffing hasn't annoyed you but as I started talking my nose decided that it would completely block. But anyway I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.